So then I'd like to call up Per Olaf Svensson. He's a fashionable hackathonista, works for Equinor uh, recently with uh, or the last 10 years with uh, Sverdrup. Really? So there we go. Thank you. So I work in the subsurface team on Johan Sverdrup. I work in field development in Equinor. Uh, so I would a fairly large field development project. I hope you all have heard about it. Um, we produce from next year, phase one, and we just handed in the, the uh, plan for development and operation of phase two, so that's also approaching. I'm going to talk about a few of the things uh, that we're doing in our team on digitalization. We're doing a lot of things. Uh, I can't talk about everything, but I've selected some, some highlights. And I realize that many of you are sort of leaning towards the technical side quite intimidating presentations uh, before lunch. Uh, <laughs> I was <laughs> glad when I saw Thierry and Trygve sort of leaning a bit the other side. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to lean slightly towards the, the, the cultural side of things because digitalization has this massive <coughs> cultural component to it that we need to, to deal with, and that's just the way it is. And I can actually back that up with some uh, data. It's uh, random data from the internet. <laughs> questionable quality taken out of context and so on. So it's probably not best practice. I stole it from Matt's blog. Uh, he did, uh, as he mentioned, did a hackathon last year in Paris uh, in the EIG and um, had this informal poll in the audience, right, as he usually do. And he asked a lot of questions, and one of them was this. What's the biggest issue for machine learning in geoscience? And it really resonates with what I'm seeing, that this is a bimodal distribution. Yes, of course, there is data issues, and we're dealing with them but we also need to focus on that second mode, which is the cultural uh, component. I extrapolate this to be not just geoscience, but also all other subsurface disciplines, of course, and, and not just machine learning, but uh, all aspects of digitalization. And when we talk about digitalization, and we talk a lot about digitalization, in fact, I'm doing it right now, we tend to talk about the things that we can define, right? The uh, things that we can fit into uh, projects and put a cost to and a goal and everything. Uh, and they also end up in our radar plot in the middle. This is our, the digital radar for our team, uh, showing what is sort of ongoing. But in between all those dots, there are hundreds of small dots that really never makes it on there because we can't really define them. It's all those small, tiny things and initiatives, all those cultural things that, that happens, uh, competence things, skills, uh, mindset, and so on and so forth. But if we imagine that we could sort of define these in, in, in a way and and extract them from the radar and put them on the side and sort them by size, it would look something like the figure on the, on the far right. And the thing is that the small ones are equally important as the big ones because they are the enablers for the big initiatives. And the big ones are the enablers for the small. And this cycle is a bit important to get going. And in our team now, we're seeing that cycle sort of starting, and that's a really good sign. That's when things start to accelerate, and that's, uh, that's a lot of fun. I'll show you one example of this, um, and I'm a bit biased towards this because I work with reservoir modeling, I uh, work with, uh, a lot with, with FMU. So the reservoir modeling workflow is traditionally a, quite a lumpy workflow. Uh, it crosses into multiple disciplines, many different specialist softwares and many different specialists running those specialist softwares. Um, lots of different data types, terminologies, and so on. And, and manual steps typically between each discipline. So FMU is a technology that allows us to build a framework that we can put all these specialist softwares into and fully automate the entire reservoir model workflow. And when we do that, of course, we improve our efficiency dramatically. We also improve the quality of what we're delivering because we can suddenly describe uncertainty better and so on and so forth. But in this context, more importantly, when FMU was sort of fully absorbed into our way of working, it started to change our mindsets, it started to change the way we uh, work, the way we communicate and collaborate across disciplines, and the way we handle data, it brought skills and competence that we didn't have. And then it started to spawn all these other small things. And then that's an example of that, that cycle sort of starting to, to happen. Another big initiative, of course, is the, is the data platform. We're building the Omnia data platform in, in Equinor. What I'm showing you here is a, not the data platform, it's an application that runs on top of the data platform. Uh, it's the reservoir experience platform, and what I'm sh it's parts of it at least. And what's shown here is, is basically co-visualization, but what the neat thing here, of course, is that this is co-visualization of data from probably 
five or six different data sources that were completely isolated before, that now are sort of put together and, and can be co-visualized. And from here on, there are two tracks. I mean, there are the analytical track and then there's the visualization track. I'm going to go over the visualization track. Uh, because mainly because I think visualization is absolutely key uh, to, to, to getting value from data. If I can get all the data from the Omnia, fine, perfect. But if, I, if, I, if I'm standing there with an SQL base or, or a CSV file with a million line, I need to visualize it to extract that insight. Uh, so we're, we're exploring visualization on many fronts. This is one example, and I realize now that I probably should have shown you something different than the front page, which is just a picture, but that's the way it uh, ended up. When we run FMU workflows, we produce lots of data. We can probably produce close to a terabyte of data several times a day. And of course, I, c I cannot spend weeks visualizing that to get sort of the insights that I need. Uh, so one way of answering that is, of course, automating it. WebVis was an answer to that. It's a Python-based framework that essentially automates visualization from restaurant model results. Wraps it into lots of nice visualizations that enables us, first and foremost, to stop making PowerPoints <laughs> just because we have a meeting. Uh, second of all, uh, it allows us to spend no time in making the visualizations. We want to spend our time discussing them, right? And what's also neat about WebVis is that it's built on, on open source components. And of course it is uh, open source back. So you can go to GitHub and download it or contribute to it or use it. We're also, and I think most of us are, exploring what possibilities there are in, in uh, virtual and augmented and mixed reality. Uh, I think we're at the point now where technology is sort of starting to catch up with what we really want to do. Uh, so Jans keeps going. Oops, sorry. Jans in the audience, you can go talk to him if you want to know more about these things. There are clever people in, in R&T working together with us in, in Svadrup and other assets in, in Equinor, building these uh, nice prototypes. Uh, we're throwing a lot of things at the wall now. Not everything will stick, but some things hopefully stick. This is one of them that I have op high hopes for. This is not a mock-up or anything like that. This is a screenshot from, uh, from a mixed reality solution in HoloLens, uh, blending digital core data with the physical core. And when we can start putting those things together in a meaningful way and give that extra dimension to looking at cores, then we're, then we're on to something. Since I worked with restaurant modeling, the first thing we did, of course, was to visualize restaurant models. I still pick up the HoloLens and look at it from time to time, but it didn't really stick. But what we wanted to know was, will it enhance value or will it, will it sort of bring something to our discussions about strainage strategy or well placement or whatever, if we can bring up model realizations like this in our office landscape and walk around it and interact with it. Many of these use cases, or many of these uh, prototypes and possible use cases are being developed all the time now. It's really a lot of fun. And we're getting to the point now where we can behave like this <laughs> without anyone <laughs> really caring. And, and there was a time when people would get visibly disturbed if they saw a geologist on the floor with something on her, <laughs> talking about something that wasn't there. <laughs> That was, uh, but uh, we're past that now, and that's, uh, that's a good sign. And then we're asking the uh, more fundamental questions. Who are we, and, and where are we going, and, and how are we working? What does a subsurface team look like? What does it look like today? What does it look like uh, in two years or five years? I don't really know. Um, and sadly, most of my colleagues, they scattered immediately when I was taking this picture. So they're all behind me. <laughs> but there were three people that uh, didn't move, and those uh, three software developers, and they were probably in the zone or something. They were just completely, <laughs> they were just, uh, completely unaware of what was going on around them. But that's one of the things that we were testing now in Svadrup. What happens if you put software developers into the subsurface team? So we have three, four software developers working in our team now, and they are not there to work for us. That's really important. They're not there as a as a sort of to pro provide a service or anything like that. They are there as a discipline, software development, on the same level as me as a geologist and a geophysicist and all those so-called traditional subsurface disciplines. I think the term subsurface discipline sort of has to go away at some point because uh, it doesn't always make sense. We're seeing a lot of new tools and we're seeing a lot of better ways of working. I mean, the, the, the simple things, you know, use Slack more and, and have less meetings. Um, we use Slack in the team all the time, and it's, I don't know what we did before that. Uh, it's, I don't know. Have more stand-ups. We have daily stand-ups every morning. 
much more efficient having a 10 minute stand up rather than his weekly one hour meetings. Many of you are developers. Uh, for those, you, you may take this for granted, but we cannot take this for granted. We actually have to work to, to get this culture uh, right. Use Python more, uh, Excel a little bit less. Python is a key component in our uh, efforts to, to try to build a digital culture. We're seeing that, first of all, we can do things that normally would have taken a long time to do in, in, in specialist softwares. We can do like that in Python with better quality as well. And it's open source and it's free. And we're seeing that once people know a little bit of coding, I'm not saying everyone in Petek should, uh, or in, in subsurface teams should be professional coders. I'm, I'm not a professional coder at all. But whenever we, we, when we know a little bit of coding, things happen. First of all, the databases start to become cleaner because people realize, oh yeah, that it matters where I put my files and it matters what I call them and it matters that the metadata makes sense because you, you can feel that pain, right? But if you never do any coding, you never feel the pain and you, you, you don't see the point. It feels the same double clicking on a file, whatever it's called, right? And, and, and that is a, a key part of the, getting that culture right and getting databases clean and getting to automate all these things that we spend a lot of time on doing. What we're doing in our team is that we're hosting regular uh, Python sessions where we just go away, sit for hours, just to block that time from our calendars. This is Python time. We can do you know, mini hackathons in the sense that we can, we can go together a group and attack a certain thing. Uh, we do small courses, maybe some of us make a tutorial and we go through it, or you sit and work. And that's just to have those four hours to sit and work and your calendar says that you're, you're busy doing something, that actually helps. And then we're trying to be a bit more agile in the way we're organizing ourselves. What we kind of immediately noticed uh, a while back and what sort of the software developers are also noticing is that, for instance, the process that I come from, restaurant modeling, has a lot of overlap with uh, software development. We think of it as different things, and there are different things, but there's so much overlap that we have something to learn from them. So one of the things that we're doing with, with restaurant modeling now is, is, is approaching it in a more agile way, focusing on minimum viable products, iterating us uh, forward to better and better uh, solutions, right? So I took a picture of our Kanban uh, board. Since the picture was taken, we've moved this to Shira. Uh, so sadly, I can't go around moving this post-it anymore, but the point is the same. And just to have that overview and to make that, have that this is a continuous process, is something that we're working on. And this is applicable for many subsurface processes. Developing a conceptual understanding of a field, for instance, that shouldn't be organized as a waterfall project, in, in my opinion. So, I think I wrote in the abstract that I would say where this is going to take us. And I, I might as well admit that I lied. I have no idea where this is going to take us. Because I don't think anyone can truly know that. Of course, we have goals and we have strategies to get there and so on and so forth. But trying to predict what this will look like in 2025 is a bit like predicting the year 2000 in 1950. We don't know. I, what I do know, and I, I feel at least quite confident uh, of, is that we're going to work in new ways. We're going to change, and we're going to change. We are changing, and we're going to change with higher and higher frequency. All right? So we're going to have to deal with that concept of of change all the time. We're going to use a lot of new tools. We are using a lot of new tools. There are new skills that uh, sort of are surviving. And we're going to have to learn to fail. We're not good at failing. And we're not good at always uh, learning by failing either. That's something we need to, a skill we need to acquire. We're going to share a lot. And we're going to collaborate a lot. I'm not talking about inside my team now, I'm talking about in the industry, of course. And of course, we're going to create a lot of value. Uh, so what we're doing now is that we're creating a, a digital culture. We see the signs that it's sort of happening, and we're having a lot of fun doing it. And I think when building a digital culture, if you're not having fun, you're probably doing something wrong, because there is a clear correlation between having a lot, lots and lots of fun and, 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 and improving the culture. 
and there are lots of fun things to, uh, to come as well. So as for the future, uh, I would say it looks uh, really, really bright. Uh, and I, I'm lucky enough to work on Johan Sverdrup and great project, uh, lots of skilled people and uh, you know, we haven't even started production yet. So what a time to be alive. Thank you. That was really interesting. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? No? Oh, there's one there. So I just noticed that, the <coughs> that uh, some of your stuff on GitHub is open source. Do you sort of have a policy on what kind of licenses that you use for your open source stuff? <laughs> Are you referring to the Volvo license? Uh, no. Um, I don't know what policy we have. What we do, I do know is that we have a policy to go open source first. So the choice is if there is a choice there, that would be to not go open source, if you see my point. So by default, what we develop in Equinor should be open source. 